Whoops, I just fell off again. Hold on here. Okay. <laughs> oh my God, it is so good to see you. <laughs> thank you, thank you. It took us a while to get it together, but we did. When I started this back in my day, even a woman being in economics was unusual, but everybody knew Indians didn't cooperate too much and didn't, you know, didn't compete. They And they always were sharing. My gosh, they just kept sharing and sharing, you know, so they're not going to make it in business. And I really was struck by a belief that I had held foundationally, but hadn't really explored, which was our culture was not our problem. Our culture was our strength and the culture that bound us together, the culture that kept us alive under some of the most brutal oppression and suppression imaginable were our values and our belief system. And they were vibrant, they were robust, and they were still at the core of who we were. So to look at an economic plan or an economy that accommodated these values and beliefs, culturally appropriate development sort of became my catch-all. And from about 1980 forward, I focused totally on how to harness the traditional knowledge and brilliance in our economies and do contemporary application into either the financial system or uh, uh, the business model or um, uh, the outputs of an economy, health, prosperity. Uh, So my next 40 some years was looking at this piece. Uh, In doing that, probably one of the most contrasting fundamental understanding that is required to really then begin to move forward and look at these two systems you need to understand the, the fundamental worldview that is behind both these systems. And when you look at the Western economic system, you're looking at a society that believes in scarcity of resources, which is a pretty fear-based belief. Yes, it is. Yes. And then individual insatiable appetites. If you believe we are just an aggregate of individuals with no relationship or connection to each other, then you're going to get as much as you can. Mm -hmm. If you believe in scarcity of resources, you are permanently building accumulation to the point of hoarding into your system. Right, right. Over to the other worldview as the starting point to the economic system, and you have an abundance of creation. So you could argue, okay, we're going to run out of fossil fuel, but what about wind? What about sun and solar? I mean, there's a prosperity in creation that is infinite and unlimited within the indigenous worldview. Uh, And so you have this prosperity of creation, and then you have a strong sense kinship based Mm -hmm. enoughness. Right. People really held ourselves and themselves accountable. Excessive consumption was not a value that anybody held up to emulate. In fact, stewardship, prudence, frugality, using all of what you have and using the variety that's out there. uh, We look at monocropping as an example. Let's all have one kind of potato. And if that kind of potato happens to get potato blight, you all die. Ireland can tell you stories about that kind of farming. When you looked at the indigenous agricultural technology, we had over 4,000 kinds of potatoes because wow. each one represented a certain kind of soil content, a certain amount of rain and a certain amount of sun. So that was really moving with mother nature in a way that diversified uh, the biological diversity, uh, the security in knowing that if this food source collapsed or needed to be uh, taboo, taboos were used to allow for restoration of resources. It was a very strict management regime. So a marine might be, a marina might be taboo where you just don't go fishing there anymore. A hunting area might be put as taboo for a period of time till it regrows and revitalizes. So these were put into place to really provide for this abundance and to provide for the diversity you needed for sustainability Mm -hmm. uh, as ways to provide for security of of the food supply. Then you get into uh, a a real, so you've got the worldviews. One of them 
really supports cooperation and sharing because the goal of the indigenous economy is to meet the most needs of the most people. That is the goal of an indigenous economy. But you look at the Western one and it is for accumulation uh, and power of a few. Mm -hmm. And so what is within that is high, high competition um, and um, accumulation. Mm -hmm. And in a, in a, you know, a jump forward, you can see why, if you always wondered how come you already have to have money to get a bank loan, it's because this system rewards accumulation. If you already have it, you're going to get rewarded because the goal is accumulation. Right. But you can see these values going throughout each system. And it's important to really hold them accountable to values. People have to begin asking themselves, what do they really value? The latest plastic doobob or life. Every single society organizes itself socially, politically, and economically according to its values. We need to hold this economy accountable to the people. All of us, not merely a part of us, all of us need to have a thriving, prosperous economy that we are part of. I went into the economy, um, I just felt like it was the belly of the beast. Yes, it is. I really did. I felt like one of those old time miners with my little flashlight on the top of my head, going down deeper and deeper and deeper into this belly of the beast that was ruining every single one of our lives. And that's exactly why it's at the forefront of what I'm doing now, the economy. So this is so wonderful, Rebecca. Do not stop. Keep going. Okay. Um, there are four key principles to an indigenous economy. Uh, the first one is community is understood as essential. Community and by community, right. I mean place. Do you know what I mean? Like where the community is and the community, they're seen as one. And so community is seen as essential. You cannot sell it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's no way you can sell it. You manifest within it and you have children that come after you. So it's not yours to begin with. It's yours to be part of. Yes. And it's all of ours to be part of. You can't sell it. You can't negotiate power blocks within the community. Uh, where you get so many that say these guys aren't allowed uh, to take part in it, uh, that it was required uh, that uh, individual liberty be balanced with communal good. Mm -hmm. Rights was balanced with responsibilities. This is, the community was the network whereby these dynamics were managed, nurtured, or mitigated. We really looked at nature as the basic source of knowledge and that it had to work within nature, be part of nature to be successful. You didn't excessively take and harvest maximum yield. You took what was needed wow. and you reciprocated by giving back when you took. So it wasn't just an extractive uh, methodology. It was generating and giving back. Yeah. Uh, and it was around very clear when game was its most available and its richest is when the hunter would go. And the hunter would never announce, I'm going to go get a moose for us because that was so arrogant. The values that were rolling into this were humility, frugality. Mm -hmm. and, and so when you did harvest an animal like a whale or a buffalo. There was very clear traditional distribution um, processes that you followed. But first and foremost, you gave thanks. You gave thanks to that animal for its sustenance for your people. That is so lost in our agricultural industry today. It is heartbreaking. The disrespect yes. that minute by minute, second by second, says it's okay to torture animals so we can get our food cheap without even a thought to their lives, complete opposite of understanding our connection to nature and building a system within this balance and respect 
for nature as the mentor and uh, ultimately the life giver. The third principle or component in an indigenous economy really was the spiritual beliefs, the beliefs behind uh, anti-excessive consumption. You really took what you needed and then you also gave back. We don't have anything in society anymore like the ceremonies and the rituals that bring us back into what is our fundamental purpose for being here among life. Mm -hmm. And I think people are very hungry for that. And I actually believe that until each individual finds that path where they discover their purpose, we're gonna have these big holes that we will continue to fill with plastic doobobs. Right. That emptiness is good for a consumer economy. They have everything riding on keeping us focused on what I say is death and destruction and this emptiness that we're gonna fill through stuff rather than through our relationships to each other and to the whole or the sacred life with, with creator. So that we look at ourselves as an interconnected uh, system where you get then this understanding, it's not a quaint practice that anthropologists always point to, but are these fundamental millennial old design principles of balance, and harmony. Mm -hmm. The economy was designed to balance within the whole, what we call nowadays sustainable. Our goal in our economy was sustainability, not growth. Mm -hmm. Sustainability was the first and foremost goal because we wanted it for our future. And for the future generations, it means we have to sustain this. We owe it to ourselves to continue through our children and through our children's children. So that sustainability is the third piece within that spiritual belief. It's that we are stewards and part of taking care of this creation. And the fourth and the final piece on it really is fascinating because it probably puts us more into the general sense of uh, an economy. And that is the cultural component is from within the context of the group. So that what we had was a critical customs of sharing, barter, customary trade, production was all done through family clan units. So mm. that you were also, you were the producer, but you also were the distributor. Um, let's take a whale harvest as an example. Same Inupiat village in Alaska. And, and now we're going back to the, the fact that the clan family unit were the producers and the distributors um, and that they really provided the economic system, which if you go back to the word economy and look at the Greek meaning, it is household. You know, it's how your household needs are met. So that this is this is rooted right in the basis of understanding what an economy is. The University of Alaska sociology department went out and mapped all of the places where a whale harvest is distributed. So they, they come in with a whale. Now you need to be able to think conceptually that whale meat is wealth. If you're in a village where you don't have stores, you don't go buy anything, whales represent a tremendous wealth being into the community. The wealth is divided up and it's distributed. And you literally cannot count the number of places and times that whale meat travels through the community huh. and how many people are part of that wealth distribution. And it even goes, if you look at those uh, trails, it even goes to intra-community sharing. So it goes within the immediate community and into the surrounding communities and even further. So this is a very vibrant, if our economy could do that, all of us would be billionaires. Right. This vibrant distribution is the fundamental precept to sustainability. Mm -hmm. If you're not going to distribute anything, you're never going to be sustainable. Right. And we got to get a grip on this fact. Some of the most sophisticated distribution vehicles I've ever seen are in indigenous economies. Case in point, look at the next map and look at the way cash comes into the exact same village and how many times it's distributed. You can count on one hand. Yeah, yeah. 
So you're looking at this economy that very deliberately has two goals, three, oh, three goals, I guess. One is sustainability first and foremost. Second is to meet the most needs of the most people. You're starting to see a difference. Mm-hmm. Yes, <laughs> yes, indeed. And you're looking at the fact that these, con- these small groups form the flexible network within this economy so that the system isn't market-based. Uh, it is mixed in that it does have money and it does have barter and trade in it. It's an extensive inter-community and inter-community exchange and barter network with some mixed cash going on into it. People's prestige and influence within the community was based on their generosity, not on how much money they had and how many gatekeepers surrounded them. Our leadership, those people that we admired and respected most were required to be. The obligation and responsibility was taking care of the whole. Not themselves. Right. <laughs> and right. not even their family, Janet, but the whole. Right. Again, we go back to a society that sees mother, daughter, aunt, uncle, brother, sister, uncle, cousin, Matt. Yes, the relational, communal, yes. Everybody has to survive. These principles are millennial old balance and harmony that has been sustainable for 40 and 50,000 years. It's not so much that indigenous people are genetically nicer (laughs) than all other people. It's our years of experience and our brilliance of systems thinking has led us to create through empirical data proof you can't, we can be sustainable. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But we have to think about this in terms of survival of the whole, not merely a part. And growth is a myth. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Growth is a cancer. Yeah, it is. It was a metastasized myth that is Mm -hmm. killing us. Mm -hmm. I also want to know if you have any ideas of how to bring forth the principles and the practices of a subsistence economy in in a greater way. Well, we need the political will. We need to strip away the sacred cow of the economy and realize that it's about as sacred as a baseball game or a golf game. This is a system we created. Mm -hmm. We made up the rules. We can change the rules. I would say first and foremost, Janet, we need to get a grip of our values. As a people, we need to really, really have a serious talk with each other. And, and let me ask you then, because I've had a couple of thoughts, and, and in the past, uh, I, I, I've covered these ideas, but I, for me, one of the basic ways we have to go about this is to look at how we measure wealth in a country. And with the GDP, uh, the wealth, our GDP goes up. Well, for instance, I'm in Florida. For instance, uh, when we had the big oil spill, uh, right. the BP. It goes up because of the cost of the cleanup. For the cleanup. Nothing but none of the cost to the coastal fishing communities, to the marine life, to any of that. So there is a form, uh, a way called genuine progress indicators. There may be others out there, but it is an accounting system. And there's a couple of states that are using it that measures not just the regular economy, but the cost of the pollution in the river. I mean, they put numbers on this. Well, you know, using your example, I get one of the um, foundational pieces for how we could make this happen is tying the externalities back into the economy. Yes. We need to place those externalities front and center within Uh, the business model. It can no longer be business as usual. Investors, companies, anybody that's part of that disaster and brutal dismantling of the community should be required to pay for it. So we did an event study to look at the stock value in relation to the events of Dakota Access Pipeline. 
This was to be about a $3 billion project on the ground to get, get it out. And, and if you remember, it was going through the, the water supply of the Standing Rock tribe. Right. And they had asked us to help lead an investor engagement strategy. So we ran these numbers and, and we were looking at it. And it had been slated for $3 billion. Uh, the industry researchers had said that energy transfer was a C-plus company, low political risk, um, and Bloomberg had rated it as a um, buy. So we went in with these stats and we began to look at this company. Well, it was already being sued in five other states for contaminated groundwater. The very thing the tribe was protesting. They were being sued, not by radicals, by the states themselves. And nobody in the financial industry picked this information up. This is valuable data. This is optimal data for how you make an investment decision. Right. Nowhere, nowhere factored in on the risk of this. So we took that and we began calculating and quantifying what the social risks cost by way of material loss. It was over $7 billion lost on that site. And it's still losing money. The stock went down by 60% and it has not recovered. These have serious costs. The rating agencies, the lending institutions all have to start factoring this risk into their investment decisions. Absolutely. And these risks have costs that have to be covered or that company does not get a social license to operate. Yes. yes. So my sense of this is to really start focusing on the markets and begin to require these externalities get put back into the cost of doing business. I just wanted to ask a couple more questions, if I may, because there are things that I am covering and I just want to see, well, I, ho I hope to cover, but I want to know how you value it. There is a public banking movement that is getting off the ground. And uh, Ellen Brown, who ran for Secretary of Treasury in California at one point, is the founder of this. Okay. And... Um, and it's all about, and it can be city banks or state-owned banks, but keeping the money local rather than right. sending to Wall Street Bank. So it's a depository for all the state fees, uh, taxes, et cetera. Um, and that's taking off. So I, when you're talking about this new, sub, uh, new framework for our economy, I, I'm seeing that as an important piece on the ground. How do you think about that? Absolutely, Janet. I didn't know about the, the new banking, but... Back in the olden days, <laughs> we did the Community Reinvestment Act because yes. banks were always sucking. I mean, the model we have in this economy is extractive, extractive, extractive. Yes. We suck everything we think is of worth right out and we move right on. And communities are being killed by this upstreaming of their deposit base. So right. we really looked at the Reinvestment Act as a requirement to get that. And, and this would be, I mean, owning your own bank is way better. We've got big is bad. We've got, we're locked into right. this mindset that big is better. Big is, dinosaurs died, guys, for a reason. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I mean, so we got to get a handle on it. What's the healthiest thing out there? Bacteria. Yeah. I mean, we got to get small if we're going to live and we got to be able that to. That is so <laughs> true. That is so true. And in, uh, all right. So the community uh, uh, develop, uh, development financial institutions, Lakota Fund is, is this, is that right? And yeah. you weren't you very involved in the launching of the Lakota Fund? And yeah, well, when I, I created an organization called uh, First Nations Development Project. Right. And uh, one of the first projects we did was on the Pine Ridge Reservation, and it was before we even knew the term microenterprise lending. We were looking at map matching credit uh, to culture. And so we were trying to find a way to provide credit that matched what we were really doing in the economy. And when we started, we started the pipeline and we got a bunch of applications for convenience stores. And I remembered saying, no, we're, we're, it's not about convenience stores, you guys. Let's go back. Let's go back to the drawing board. Let's just go out and ask people, what do you do to make money? Well, we were lucked out because we'd hired this really brilliant local guy, um, Richard Sherman, to do an informal sector study then. And he went out house by house and 83% of the households on Pine Ridge were doing income generating activities. 
Uh, some were uh, building rough wow. box coffins, mending fix fences, hairstyling, lunch catering, changing the locks in the government buildings. I mean, it was busted wide open, unbelievable, vibrant, informal economy. And it was like, that's it, that's it. That's what we want to lend to. So we created the Lakota Fund with, with that first. Okay. And then the Ford Foundation had been funding us and they said, have you heard of the Grameen Bank? And we were like, no. And so then they brought Dr. Yunus over. It was hilarious. They brought Dr. Yunus over to Pine Ridge and he's like, we had 3.2 people per square mile, right? <laughs> and he's dying out there where there's nothing for as far as he can see. And we, right. and then they send us over there and they got like 3000 people <laughs> per square mile and you're standing around like this. It was hilarious, but what an informative trip. I mean, it yeah. really was. Yeah. And so we got to see, micro lending and we just absolutely grabbed onto the name. Uh, and in a way it was like one of our biggest successes but it was one of our biggest failures too because we didn't go out there with a micro enterprise project. We went out there with a development process whereby people tapped in their own innate problem solving and entrepreneurial brilliance. Mm -hmm. That's what the true success story was. That's still alive and vibrant out there because at every step of the way, Lakota people were the problem solvers and the ones, uh, sure, you can go out and you can make a decision that might be wrong, but you can regroup, you know? And so that ability of a process that was really listening and really adapting to different stages in the community's capacity uh, is, is to me the real success. I mean, the micro lending and the community CDFIs are great. And I was involved in the legislation to create the government models for it and the CDFI agencies. And they're great, but they are business tools. They're not going to solve That's the right. way they were probably sold. Uh, and it's important to know the difference. Uh, we've got structural problems around the poverty that just access to credit aren't going to solve. So we were really looking at this as a very good piece. Um, and and then we picked up the language and microenterprise and CDFIs became uh, a, a really legitimate and major force out there and still are. And yes, then I worked are. with the Calvert investment people. Again, this was the idea of if you, if you think what you're trying to do in this economy is tap into a wealth source and get a redistributive vehicle for it. I was playing with the Calvert Social Investment Fund when I went on the board to try to get private sector investment into the microloan funds and the community development financial institutions. Right. So we went through our shareholders and we got the legal clearance for it. And we came up with the only really private sector uh, instrument for individual investment in these low income loan funds, which was called community notes. To do it, we built a Calvert Foundation and we took 1% of our portfolio, which the shareholders had voted for us to do, and used it as the startup for community notes where individual investors can come in now and we can uh, wholesale and retail. And, and that's still home. going on, the community. Oh, absolutely. It's in the yeah. buildings now. Yeah. 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 Uh, you're, you're an impressive, awesome woman, <laughs> Rebecca. <laughs> yeah. All that you've done. Um, what is, is this going to be a... Are you doing a docu-series? I'm, I'm doing, well, I may end up doing a docu-series. I'm hitting the road with a camera person and editor um, in September to interview folks like yourself who are really significantly making a difference in changing the economy. Um, and Ellen Brown with the public banks is one, folks working on reparations uh, for black Americans and another. And then there is, uh, I, are you aware of the commercial size worker-owned cooperatives in Cleveland? They're worker-owned, they've captured the purchasing power of anchor-based institutions like the Case Western uh, and University Hospital. And that's what makes them so big and powerful. So they keep, they keep part of that billions of dollars that have been going outside the community for commodities and services in the community. And the worker owners originally were former felons and now they're low income folks that come in. They own the business and they're sharing in the profits. And so that's a model that is a big model. I get hit all the time on the question, yeah, but how would this fit today? You know, yes. Does, do you feel like 
that kind of pushes back on it because I this does not have to go in some quaint buckskin and beadwork. No, 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 no. And and that's what I'm looking for is how those principles are being applied. I think the public banking, the worker, the commercial size worker on cooperatives on the ground are all examples that are bringing that those principles and practices to the forefront of the subsistence economy. I do think that's real. You know, I bet you could take all those projects that you're looking at and place them underneath a particular subsistence economy principle. I would love to do that. And I would need your help with that. Um, yes. Think about it, Janice. Just, just let it organically go for a while and see what, yes. I used to do that with our grant making. It was fascinating. I mean, we could place them right under uh, Mother Nature as the mentor or massive redistribution or, but well, we could find them placed. Right. In, and most of them, when we were making grants and they were submitting a proposal, fascinatingly, all of them came in with, in the small print between the lines, the goal was to meet the most needs of the most people. Wow. See, that is such a simple approach. Right. Just, you know, that's what we're supposed to be doing. I know. And the policy making that can come out of that with just that thought in mind. Yeah. Yeah. OK, I won't keep you any longer. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. OK, I look forward to talking with you again. You too. Bye bye. bye, -bye.